Greetings, from Tony Broom Ministries. Here is Pastor Tony, with a Bible message that has three words for the title, Sin No More. The expression, sin no more, is found three times in the Bible. But is it really possible to sin no more? While it is not possible to be sinless as long as we are in this life, we can indeed sin less. We'll never be sinless, but we can sin less. When Jesus says, sin no more, he wants us to know that we as believers no longer live in sin. We do not practice sin. Provision before salvation. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34, the scripture says, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. In this declaration, God is letting us know that he has made provision for our salvation. Even though they failed to keep the old covenant, under the new covenant, one could have freedom, life, and peace. The old covenant was made to be the foundation for the coming of Christ. God chose Israel to bring the Messiah into the world, and he made covenant with them. But he said, my covenant they regarded not. I had to regard them not because they had broken my covenant. But God had made provision for our salvation. In order for us to be in a position where we could have power over sin, God had to have made provision for our salvation before the world even began. Sin did not take God by surprise. It disappointed Him. It broke His heart. But it didn't take Him by surprise. He didn't wait until man fell in the Garden of Eden before he did something about it. God made provision long before the world was created as we know it and time had begun. God made provision for the salvation and healing of every soul. And he tells Jeremiah, it's recorded several times in the Old Testament and a couple times in Hebrews, so that we would know that this covenant that God would make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, after those days that he would make a covenant wherewith he would write the laws of God into their hearts and put them in their minds. And we are now under the new covenant. But there had to be provision made so that all of this could take place. This would take place and happen because of God's provision. God told Jeremiah, you will not have to teach every man, all right, let's get ready, let's go to church, let's brush your teeth, know the Lord, come on now, let's do right, pick your feet up, sit up straight. You want to do all that. We do that to children. But he said you will not have to teach every man his brother and every man his neighbor, saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. How will that be? It's because of the provision that God made. I will make a covenant with them because I have made provision for their salvation. This is a covenant that I will make that I will remember their sin no more. God has a desire to make covenant with us. In fact, the covenant that he has now is not so much between man. It's a covenant between God and his son. God sent forth His Son into the world when the time was just right to be born of a virgin, to be born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. And those who were outside of the law, He brought them in as a people to be a special people to God. Those who sought me not have found me now. Those who were not a people are now the people of God. This happened because of the provision that God made. The provision not at the time that we had sinned, but provision before salvation. You cannot wait till the time of salvation 
to try to come up with a provision, to come up with a solution. God already had made provision. God already had a solution before the problem. Isn't that the most wonderful thing that you have ever heard? We have all these problems now in our world, and we're trying to dash around and grab straws and do everything that we can to come up with solutions for our problems. God already had the solution before the problem was even manifest. Provision before salvation. Sin no more because of the provision before salvation. Sin no more because a miracle has taken place. After a miracle, here is John chapter 5, verse 5 through the first part of verse 9. And a certain man was there at this pool of Bethesda. There were many sick people lying there. And an angel comes down at a certain season and troubles agitates the water. And whoever steps in first is made whole of whatever plague he has. And this certain man was trying to get there. Always trying but always failing. A certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Thirty-eight long years he was lying there, trying. He was lying and trying, but he never could succeed. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Don't you want to be healed? Don't you want to be made whole? And he's saying that to everyone right now. There are many people floundering around in sin in this world. And Jesus is saying to them, don't you want to be whole? Don't you want to be right? Don't you want to get right with God? Don't you want to lay your head on your pillow tonight and sleep without sin, without guilt? You can sin no more. Don't you want to be right with God? They go on in their sin and they go on in their foolish ways. And Jesus is saying to them, as it were, don't you want to be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another stepping down before me. Oh, shucks, as it were, he says. I miss it again. And every time it happened, then he would wait for the next time, hoping, waiting, waiting, hoping. When the next time comes, he says, Maybe I'll get it this time. Just like the woman with the issue of blood, she kept hoping, she kept praying, and she kept trying, and she kept failing. She would go to a new doctor she heard about in town. The ladies told her about it. Girl, you need to go to him. Maybe he can help you. Girl, there's this lady doctor over there. She knows about women's problems. Maybe she can help you out. She would always go. She kept going, and she kept losing her money, and finally she got to the point where... She had spent all she had, and physicians didn't make her any better, but she got worse. Yet, when she heard of Jesus, she came to him, and now all her problems were over. She got healed. This was what she'd been searching for. And here's the impotent man, the paralyzed man, at the pool of Bethesda. Bethesda, Bethesda, house of mercy. Thank God for the mercy of God that came to that man that day. And thank God for the mercy of God that has come to you and I in our life. That He reached down into that pool and picked us up. We could not help ourselves. We could not do anything to save ourselves. The only thing we could do is respond to the gospel. And thank God we've done that. Jesus said, don't you want to be well? Don't you want to be whole? Don't you want to be made whole? Well, I do, but there's always somebody that gets there before I do. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. In verse 14, Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Jesus did not tell him, Sin no more, or I'll put something worse on you than what you had before. That's not what he told him. What he means is, if you continue living in sin, you will bring worse things on yourself. It's not that God is putting things on us. I wish somehow, and I wish my 
discipleship pastor tells us you don't get anywhere by wishing. Well, maybe you don't, but it sure makes me feel better. I just wish somehow that people could get it in their mind that God is not the one that's doing the bad things to them. Lord, please don't take my dog away from me. Lord, please don't take my mama away from me. Lord, please don't take my baby away from me. You're always thinking that God is the one who's going to take something away from you. For God so loved the world that he took everything away from us. Okay? You want to say John 3.16 that way? You know that's a mistake. And I did it on purpose. For God so loved the world that he gave. God is not out to take things from you. Oh, glory, he called by high tide, live by say. Oh, God, help us, Lord. Help us to clear our minds from this delusion of the adversary. God is out to give you things. The devil is the one who takes your baby. The devil is the one who takes your mama. The devil is the one who takes your puppy dog away from you. The devil is the one who comes to steal and kill and destroy. It's not God. Now, beloved, I know that God calls people home. The story is told, the true story is told of Wigglesworth when he was living. His dear beloved wife, Polly, all of a sudden she fell dead. She died one evening. And God has used this man to heal people. He's used this man to raise people from the dead. So Wigglesworth just goes in there and he raises her from the dead. And the first thing she did, she looked at him and she called him Smith. She said, Smith, what in the world have you done? God reassured them that he indeed was ready to call her home. We don't know why she was called home at 51, I think it was, years of age. Wigglesworth had hoped that they would have a long ministry and life together, blessing people all over the world and being used by the Lord. That's not the way it happened. We don't know all the things of God. Even Jesus told the disciples, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that God has put in his own power. But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you'll be witnesses unto me. We don't know these things. We know that God certainly calls saints home. Every saint of God who dies is called home to be with the Lord. But yet, there are things that people still put to God's account that shouldn't be there. They blame God for taking something from them, and it's not God that's taking something from them. God wants to give things to you, and He's already given you everything. He gave His only begotten Son. When judgment comes on us, we bring it on ourselves. Yes, God has to judge sin. And He will pour His wrath out on this world, those who know not God. Revelation tells us that. Second Thessalonians chapters 1 and 2 that tells us about that. God will pour His wrath out on those who do not know God. But the judgment that America, the judgment that individuals, people even in churches, are bringing on themselves, it's not that God is throwing down boulders from heaven on you. Jesus tells this man, sin no more. You've had a miracle take place in your life. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come on you. Not that he's going to put a worse thing on you, but you're going to bring worse things on yourself because you continue living in sin. What he's telling this man is do not practice sin anymore. Do not sin anymore. Doesn't mean never make a mistake. Doesn't mean be sinlessly perfect. But he said, sin no more. Don't live in sin because worse things can happen to you. In love and appreciation, in John chapter 8, verse 3 through 11, this is a story, and I'll read it to you from the Scripture. The woman caught in the act of adultery. It was set up, no doubt, by the Pharisees. But anyway, she was brought before the Lord. They asked Him what does He think they should do. They didn't really want to know. They were trying to tempt the Lord. The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? 
This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. What do you have to say about it, Master? If he had said, don't worry about what Moses said, then they would have something to accuse him. They could accuse him of breaking the law. But if he said, go ahead and stone her, that's what Moses told you to do, then they would accuse him there too. I thought you came to love. I thought you came to help people. So any way he would have answered them to answer their question directly, they would have had something to come back at him with. But notice Jesus' response. He stoops down, begins to write on the ground. What do you think he wrote? Well, I don't know exactly what he wrote. Thank God we better be glad we don't know what he wrote. Because if I'd have been there that day, he'd have been writing my sins. That is, if I were still a sinner. And he'd be writing your sins if you were still a sinner. He was writing their sins and most likely putting their names, attaching their names to their sins. You're talking about making an email message and putting an attachment to it. That's what he was doing. Here's a subject, John Doe. Body of the message says, these are the sins of John Doe. Please see the attachment below. There it is. All the sins of John Doe were being written out. He wrote, he knows everything, you know, and he wrote it on the ground. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. You say in the law it says she should be stoned? Okay, let the one who is without sin among you throw the first rock. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. It's amazing what silence can do sometimes. We who do used to be radio and now webcasting, we don't like silence. Silence is bad. Silence means I don't know what I'm going to say next, or silence means that something is happening with the technology or something's going on. One thing we do, and I just did it, was to swallow and try to clear my throat. You know what? I don't leave that in there for you to hear. I go in there and take that software and I take that little old out. You don't need to hear all that. I go in there and take it out. Jesus, he left them with silence writes on the ground, brings out their sin, and they begin to be convicted. We need in our day, again, the conviction of the Holy Ghost. You know why many of us in our age group got saved when we did, and certainly we should have gotten saved before we did, but you know why there are many in our age group that got saved is because of the conviction of the Holy Ghost. And that is missing. Not that the Holy Ghost is not doing His job, but we're not allowing the gospel to be presented. We present Jesus as love and that He is. We present God as love and that He is. But we don't present it like you got to repent of your sin. you got to come out of your sin. you got to repent and be sorry for your sin and get right with God. Let the Holy Ghost convict you of sin. The Holy Ghost will convict you of sin far before you get saved. Most of the time, you get saved, but the Spirit has been working on you before that. He convicted you of your sin. These people, they begin to slip away, starting at the eldest, then to the last. When the young people saw the old ones leaving, they said, well, I guess we better get out of Dodge too. Maybe the young ones are hard-headed more than the others. I don't know. I know some old codgers that's pretty hard-headed, don't you know? But anyway, they slipped away. and There was nobody left but Jesus and the woman standing before him. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and you know he knew to keep writing those sins of those people until every one of them were gone. When he had lifted up himself, saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And she called him Lord. Praise God for that. That's the first 
wonderful thing she did. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He did more than let her go. He could have said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way. See you later. Alligator after a while, crocodile. No, he didn't do that. He said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What was he telling her to do? Go away from me and be perfect? No. He was saying, go away. Die to sin. Let the power of sin be broken over your life. Go and sin no more. He did more than let us go. He set us free. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans chapter 6 verse 2 says, We have been born again, and we need to be sanctified. How shall we who are dead to sin? You die to sin. You die to yourself daily, but you don't die to sin daily. You die to sin once. When God sanctifies you and He breaks the power of sin over your life, how shall we who are dead to sin? Now, he didn't say, how shall we who are born again? Because you can be born again and still struggling with that old nature, with that old man. But if that old man is dead, how shall we who are dead to sin? When are you dead to sin? When that work of sanctification takes place in your heart and life. Will you still be tempted? Of course You'll be tempted as long as you're on this earth. But you're dead to sin. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Doesn't mean you'll never make a mistake. But it means that you will not practice sin. You will not live in sin. A born again person will make that decision. And you need to make that decision. As a born again person, you need to make that decision to allow Christ with the Holy Spirit and the blood of Calvary to sanctify you, break the power of sin over your life. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verse 11 through 14, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Quit living like you're still under law, and live like you're under grace, because that you are. You have been born again. Your sins have been forgiven. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. The natural, it's not natural, but the spiritual, natural, and normal thing for you to do now, that the light has come, darkness has passed, the light has come, old things are passed away, all things have become new, you're a new creature in Christ, and the thing that you should do is go ahead and allow God to sanctify you and break the power of sin over your life. 1 John chapter 3, verse 6 teaches that whosoever abides in him does not keep on sinning. And verse 9 says that he who is born of God does not keep on committing sin. That is, we do not practice sin. Sin has been done away with. We have passed from darkness to life and we have allowed God to crucify that old nature and kill that old nature and the power of sin is broken over our life. He tells the man at the pool of Bethesda, sin no more. Provision had already been made. Jeremiah talked about it. Their sins and their iniquities will I remember. I will remember their sin no more. That provision has been made. And he tells the man at the pool of Bethesda, you've had a miracle take place in your life. You've been divinely healed. For us, perhaps it's divine healing, but you've been born again. You've had a miracle take place in your life. The greatest miracle that will ever happen to anybody is a new birth. You've had a miracle take place in your life. Sin no more. 
lest a worse thing come to you. What is a worse thing? It's the worst thing when a believer keeps on trying to live and practice sin. You live in sin. You're torn up. You struggle. You want to serve God. You've been born again. And you're still trying to hold on to the world with one hand and God with the other. You cannot do it. You cannot serve two masters. You will love the one and hate the other or hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve the spiritual divine God and the natural physical world. You cannot do it. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come to you. Not that God's not to bring a worse thing to you, but it's worse because you cannot continue to live in and practice sin. In love and appreciation, where are those who condemn you? If God be for us, who can be against us? Has any man condemned you? No man, Lord. Well, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus wants to save you right now. If you have not been saved and made Him your Lord, you need to do that right now. Receive Him as Savior. Make Him your Lord. Ask Him to come into your heart. Take over your life. Be born again. If you're born again and haven't put the power of sin under your feet and in the grave and let the old man fall in there and die you need to do it right now don't wait all you have to do is receive it by faith the same faith that saved you will sanctify you the same faith that sanctifies you will baptize you in the Holy Ghost all you have to do is receive it by faith let him sanctify you let him fill you with his Holy Spirit he wants to do that Sin no more. You don't have to. You don't have to sin every day. You don't have to live in sin. You don't have to be in sin. You don't have to live in sin. You don't have to die in sin. Jesus comes to save you from sin. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, Paul said, of whom I am chief. If God could save that rank sinner, the Apostle Paul, which he wasn't an apostle then, if he could save Saul of Tarsus, change his life and use him mightily in the ministry, he can do the same thing for you and I. God is no respect of persons. What he has done for one, he can do for another. He may not do the same exact thing with us that he did with the Apostle Paul, but you are a believer. When you are born again, He can use you mightily, and He will use you mightily, just like He did the Apostle Paul. God is able to do the same thing for us that He did for Him, and He has done the same thing. Paul said, the one who works in Peter is working mightily in me. And I can say that this evening. No, I'm not an Apostle Paul. I can tell you that. But I have the same Savior that the Apostle Paul did. I have the same Holy Spirit the Apostle Paul did. I have the same sanctifying power the Apostle Paul did. I have the same baptism in the Holy Ghost the Apostle Paul did. The same God who worked in him works in us right now. You don't have to live in sin. He tells you the same thing that he said to the woman caught in adultery and they set her up no doubt but there she is guilty standing before him and he lifts himself up has anybody condemned you no man Lord neither do I condemn thee go and sin no more have you been encouraged by the Bible message maybe you have given your life to Christ and received him as Savior and made him Lord Let us know by visiting TonyBroom.com and sending us a message by using the form on the contact page. Sin No More has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.